Thank you for the invitation for this conf. I think it's on. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, like. <laughs> okay. I'm not a singer, <laughs> so so can't do it. Uh, so thank you for the invitation, Teresa, to this uh, fantastic meeting. It's a lot of inspirations yesterday, and I think we will continue in this way. And uh, the, the topic of my talk will be to present you uh, the slime molds as an organism that can be uh, the nucleus of interdisciplinary activities. Uh, I mean, going back to biology, uh, I'm, I was usually concerned with organisms in extreme environments. That is my speciality in uh, biology, and uh, there are the questions, uh, how far can life go? What are the limits of life, and what are the basic principles of life that allows them to go to these limits? So uh, there's a whole field called astrobiology, which uh, deals with all these problems. What, and what is the origin of life uh, in connection with that? Uh, so, but uh, the, the, the basic problem of this research is that we have hardly any good definition what are the basic processes of uh, life. And uh, if we would find life on another planet, would we recognize it? Because uh, it could be guided by completely different laws. Uh, the processes, I guess, are thermodynamically seen the same thing, but uh, the rules can be much different. But uh, going back to our own planet, we see a lot of life that is ruled by these basic processes but looks completely different, and slime molds is one of them, so it's the blob. There was a movie in the 50s, 70s, I think, and in the 80s too. Uh, scared people, so it scared scientists uh, for a while, but I think you know, we're in good shape and uh, we appreciate uh, the beauty also of the slime molds. So that is actually bringing me back to the talk of uh, today. And I just want to point out that these organisms are absolutely gems of nature, which you find in the shade of forests. It's uh, magic. Uh, the places where you can find them, they have tremendous uh, forms, colors, and shapes. And uh, they are mostly uh, actually in the humid shade of uh, forests, as I said. Uh, sorry. Oh, by the way, this is the Physeron polycephalum when it makes spores. So that is the end stage of its life. So what we see here uh, is an intermediate stage. It's a foraging, nourishing state when it uh, gains all the energy that is required to form these uh, many-headed fruit bodies. That is the goal of the organism. That is why it is doing all this, what we are studying. I guess this one is another example that is quite common in the forests of the Alps. Uh, and would you imagine that this is the same species? It's the same individual, actually. Uh, it's just fruit bodies in different stages. It's fantastic what you can see here. And it's, perf it's no way, that is no, it has no, nothing slimy at all. So the, what we are studying, the slime, is a stage of its life. But here it's completely dry. It wants to get rid of the spores, wants to distribute them all over the planet. So this brings us a bit to the stages of uh, uh, the slimy life. Uh, that is what I teach uh, the students in the courses. Uh, this is the fruit bodies you saw just on the last slide. And it goes all along uh, the life. And when two cells that fit to each other merge, then uh, it starts, the organism starts with the production of this huge mass of slime of yellow blob. When does it get to the stage to form fruit bodies? When it is dry, when it is becoming colder, when it is more shady? And, and I mean, when, when it needs to go, go to the light, uh, moves up when it's starving, then it starts to make these fruit bodies to produce the spores, the goal of its biology. So. Uh, that was just a brief overview of the life. Uh, now, uh, again, back to the tree of life that we also saw yesterday. This is a kind of different version. And uh, uh, this I show you just to point out that the slime molds, the ones we are studying here, are here, whereas man 
animals, uh, fungi, and plants are on this uh, tiny little twig here. So this is real basil in eukaryotes. Uh, cells that have a uh, nucleus that have uh, shed their genomes in, a, in an envelope, that is the eukaryotes. And that starts here, out from these prokaryotic earlier forms of life that emerged four billions of years, no, four, three billions of years ago. So the, actually the organism is a very basal one uh, in our branch and uh, whatever we learn about this organism tells us a lot about the evolution of our own. So that's an approach that is uh, done by uh, phylogenomics, a, a branch of uh, biology that is studying the relationship of genomes and how they evolved over time. And as it seems, some of it we heard yesterday, all these basic organisms, often unicellular, not multicellular organisms, uh, heaped up a lot of material uh, in their genomes for a, a wide range of functions which are subsequently lost in the organisms uh, that are more uh, progressed, like us. So we lost a lot of things in our genomes, actually, that is still present in the uh, genomes of Pfizer. Another reading outside. Uh, and uh, another thing is, uh, it was very difficult to get the genome of Pfizer. It took uh, the people uh, more than 10 years because the genome is so scrambled with a lot of junky DNA. DNA that is apparently not used by the organism, but this is just pumped out uh, during, uh, the, uh, during its life, yeah? uh, when it expresses genes, when it makes functions. It has a lot of supernumerary uh, material in its genome. This is also quite interesting. We don't understand yet why this is uh, the case, why it's kept. So, uh, how about uh, how the organism moves along? And that is uh, a kind of a section through uh, a plasmodial vein. As you saw this plasmodia already. This is the growing front. This is a section through a vein. And it's very characteristic that uh, the internal part of this tube is, uh, is like, um, yeah, like a f uh, allows a free flow of uh, liquid. Whereas at the periphery, we have these uh, wrinkled mass of uh, membrane staples, of biomembrane staples, uh, which uh, host uh, the muscle, so to say. Uh, here's where the constriction forces take place in the organs. And the constriction is like a muscle that shrinks uh, the tubes in a quite similar way as our own muscles. And that causes uh, the internal fluid in this so-called endoplasm to flow along uh, the tube. That is the basic mechanism of transport. So it, it's, it's, it's guided by peristalsis. And that's the same thing that we have in our gut, in our intestines. Peristalsis moves the uh, food that we are digesting. So uh, the slime mold it has no brain, as we learned yesterday, and we know, of course, but it works uh, like a gut. So is it working with gut feelings, Bauchentscheidungen? Yeah. That's kind of a very interesting analogy that I found after yesterday's talk. And uh, of course, they have simple heuristics. So uh, what is happening in the, in the tubes is that the uh, liquid is moved back and forth. It's not just in one direction, like in our intestines normally. Um, so it's moving back and forth, and by this back and forth, uh, all uh, the nutrients and signals and information is transported back and forth. So it's very interesting. It's like a link reversal. And uh, so the, we, we have different mechanisms in this organism. We have this transport of information, but we have also the action of information uh, to the periphery. So it's, it's kind of a mixed system. And this is all it makes. It's actually, it's a quite easy organism. We make it a bit complicated with our smartness thoughts. 
so to sum up this section of the talk, it's a, the plasmodium, a characteristic of these true slime molds or mixogastria, uh, is a single gigantic multinucleated cell. So the thousands of nuclei in this uh, plasmodium, and it can attain about several meters in diameter. So it's the hugest cell on Earth, so to say, and it forms networks. And through this network formation, it is able to process biological information <coughs> and solve uh, several tasks that seem quite interesting to us because it has to do with dis decisions that we also make. It is, uh, and we look for parallelism in uh, the decision making of brainy organisms and organisms that work with these uh, gut feelings, so to say. And one of the big advantages is, is it's easy to culture the slime. Well, that's why we're studying it, because it's easy to work with. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part of all this is that uh, uh, Fusarum is avoiding the light. So it's uh, growing in the shade, as you see on, on this side. So it's avoiding the lighty regions. And uh, uh, yesterday there was a question about uh, circadian uh, rhythms and actually it doesn't have one, but it is very, very sensitive uh, to light, and of course uh, the, the daily light course uh, causes uh, the fusarium to grow, or to, uh, to grow faster or to grow slower. So in the night it would grow faster. So I just cared about the blob, perhaps. Uh, the maze uh, we saw yesterday, I don't want to discuss this in more detail, but there's another uh, point that was uh, put forward by behavioral ecologists working with slime molds, that it is a kind of external memory. So wherever the slime mold grew, uh, it will not grow again because it has uh, some inhibitory uh, substances in its slime tracks uh, that will not allow the uh, re uh, this, uh, excursion on, on the used uh, regions. It's not completely true, because if it's starving and it's uh, desperate, then it will grow back again to these regions. So it's a, it depends on the uh, nutritional stage. And of course, we heard yesterday about the, the, uh, the topic of anticipation, which is kind of an adaptation to a periodic uh, events. So it is not only spatial uh, adaptive, it's also periodically adaptive in the fourth dimension, so to say. Well, uh, the basic principles I tried to work out uh, in a uh, little bit, uh, we have uh, a parallel information flow that led to, uh, leads to dislocated and decentralized information processing. So there's no central processing unit like in a, a standard computer. And uh, non-linear linear dynamics studied by the physicists, which we need very much in this uh, research, could explain why these uh, systems have uh, uh, oscillatory behavior and uh, develop this kind of uh, smart smartness. So when we want to work with slime molds, we usually use petri dishes. But uh, one of the goals of the past uh, uh, suffering months was uh, to develop something that uh, looks like a chip, because uh, working with a flat uh, small area of uh, growing slime mold is much nicer because you can put it on a screen, like here, and you can uh, film it with a camera, you can record the images, and you can process the images, and you can uh, uh, image to the slime mold another piece of uh, image. So you, it's kind of, you can create a, a feedback loop, which I will not present today, but I will show you how to uh, produce uh, these uh, tiny flat uh, chambers for physical growth. And um, as we heard before, uh, as a slime mold evades uh, light and, work on, and uh, tends to grow in the dark regions, it's possible to direct the slime mold very precisely with the, uh, the screen images. And this is the basis for what we would call biological computing with uh, slime molds. It's work in progress. So I don't know if, how much time would I have. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we can, we can, yeah, 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 just to talk a little bit smooth. Uh, so 
we work with, a, with one species of slime molds, and this one species has different strains, and you can confront these strains too, and kind of an old war. Uh, so uh, the different strains are competing for uh, pieces of oats, and it, it's a very interesting uh, dynamics here, and you can really uh, investigate a game theoretic, uh, theoretic question with this approach. But that approach is only possible with the same species, because we uh, discovered that the slime molds, the plasmodia, grow completely different when, they, when it's different species, and that is uh, the part of biology that fascinates me very much. So I try to be a bit faster here. Uh, we have three different species and studied uh, the growth uh, dynamics and uh, the uh, responsiveness to chemical cues. Uh, three species which are very common and uh, distinct in uh, the phylogenetic trees and they produce different fruit bodies so we can distinguish them uh, nicely. And we, for example, um, we, we did some chemotactic uh, uh, investigations. That means that uh, we are studying the uh, attraction of, well, I have to go here, okay, of uh, the slime mold uh, towards uh, glucose to, to sugar. How much is it, is it attracted to sugar? And we see this in four parallel experiments, and we see that uh, there is some tendency to grow towards the sugar, but uh, it's very hard to calculate this, uh, to quantify it, because it's a network, it's a growing network. It's not a single cell that you, you can uh, uh, measure the distance. You have to measure the network. So there was a um, uh, kind of index created, and according to this index, uh, we see that the different species of uh, slime molds we studied uh, react completely different uh, to different sugars. So one, you cannot extrapolate from one species to the other. And uh, the other point is that they also grow uh, differently, uh, or the, the strategies of growth are quite different. Here we see a video of um, Fusero, the typical one. Most of us are studying the Japanese uh, strain. So you see how it is pumping uh, in an oscillatory manner in, the, in, in uh, about uh, every 90 seconds uh, more uh, of this uh, plasmodial mass towards uh, the other side of the Petri dish. A very regular, yeah, more or less regular pattern here. I mean, at the end it will stop, more or less. Okay. So, so keep this in mind, how, how Physarum is growing. And now look at the second species and see the difference, how this one grows. Oh, sorry, that is, that is Physarum. That is Physarum polycephalum, much faster. And the strain before was, was uh, much slower. So that's very much faster. That is Physarum. The other one was Batamia. And the third one is very interesting. This is a completely different one. It grows like this. And the interesting part is that it, it can protrude uh, veins, but it can also retract them in the same run. You see? And then again, on the, on the same roots, so the self-inhibitory effect that we saw with the external memory uh, in Physarum is not working here. So this one is growing on its own dirt, so to say. It doesn't matter. We will stop here, this takes a bit longer. Uh, kind of, just finish in two minutes, okay? okay? Okay, and you can, of course, put this as a, a nice uh, picture, which has some aesthetics. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> sorry for disrupting the aesthetics. Uh, and uh, yeah, don't need to. So we, uh, to sum up, uh, we see that physical research is a multidisciplinary endeavor. And it links biologists of different branches, uh, chemists who study the uh, metabolites of uh, physarum and physicists together in one group interested in the same thing but in different aspects and it's very very interesting in this group of people because 
you learn so much. You learn from the other people. You learn how they think, and this influences your own creativity very much. And especially the work together with artists, which I appreciate, are also in the project that we are about to finish, Chip. And uh, so let's hope that uh, this interdisciplinary research will continue in the future. Because I think that uh, after thinking to my co-workers, uh, that Fusorum is a treasure te chest for science and art. It's the golden blob in the library of Seattle. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Sure.